So those who are online can hear us, right? Can you hear us? Thank you, Mike. Yes. Hello. Yes. Guys, welcome to the seminar, uh, see the seminar. Uh, last Friday, uh, Dr. Vignesh Nayan must have come here. I, I, I know he did and uh, introduced the seminar on how it could be done. It's the same way that it was done last time. So no surprises there. Um, the uh, class will be held in person unless you have a disability or other uh, form of need to join online. Um, and um, one thing I wanted to, uh, and the other thing is remember that uh, while we don't have any uh, exam, uh, you are to send every Friday that we have the seminar, your review of the, uh, in the seminar. So take the notes and write it up in your own language so that I can assess whether you, you know, got, you know, you understood what was presented here. Um, we certainly would have opportunity to ask questions, and that is welcome. Um, it's up to you, up to the speaker, whether they want to take the, the question in between, but something at the end, while you're fortunate for asking questions. Are you also available to give my own views on anything that is presented here? One uh, thing I wanted to ask of you is that if you guys have any specific interests on covering, you know, on, on the topics, uh, I will. Mean, uh, I'm, I'm happy to put in my effort and try and recruit. I can't guarantee, but I can try and recruit uh, a faculty or a researcher in that particular area of your interest, um, should I find it. But of course, I need to be able to see that that will broadly uh, interest uh, all others. Um, otherwise, I will um, you know, choose uh, what topics I consider to be interesting, and that may not match everybody's, but. Uh, I'll be mostly, um, if, if allowed to choose on my own, I'll likely choose the topics that are very active these days um, in, the, in, in the computer science uh, area. So um, uh, I think uh, we certainly have a plan from very exciting topics and uh, things, but as I said, um, if I hear a good recommendation from you, and uh, uh, you know, let's say a few of you are interested in that topic, then I'll be. Uh, I'll put in my effort to get speaker and joining in the world. Okay. So with that, uh, first uh, presentation is by Ruan Vikrama uh, Rachi. Vikrama Rachi. Vikrama Rachi. And I am Vikrama Rachi. Vik, yeah. Yeah. But uh, we always say Ruan. So. And um, it's a you know topic that uh, has something to do with um, uh, scene understanding, uh, that means vision, that means autonomous driving. And um, in a particular stage of uh, AI, particular theme of AI, uh, just to give very quick context, uh, neurosymbolic AI is supposed to be the third phase of AI. The first phase of AI was uh, symbolic AI of the last century, then statistical AI ending in the generative AI, which is very hard for us now. And then um, the next phase is uh, considered to, so, so, you know, expected to be this neurosymbolic AI. So you're going to get exposure to you know, the next generation of AI in the context of the hot application or challenging application of autonomous driving. Is that to work? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending uh, my talk. Uh, uh, the title of my talk is uh, A Neurosymbolic AI Approach to a Scene Understanding. So before I uh, dive into uh, what I mean by scene understanding, uh, what type of uh, neurosymbolic AI solutions that we have devised. Uh, let me first uh, walk you through some examples of, uh, you know, to look at how good the uh, autonomous driving uh, is. So these are, this is the first fatality uh, registered uh, with respect to uh, autonomous driving uh, a vehicle. This is a Uber self-driving car accident that caused, uh, unfortunately caused uh, uh, death of a, a woman in Arizona. 
uh, then uh, this is another uh, scene uh, that where you know uh, a car crashed into a truck uh, flipped uh, in upside down on a highway because uh, it could not uh, determine what to do because uh, the training data might not have actually had this kind of an example um, the third one is a uh, so this is actually a, uh, a group of people uh, who are uh, you know, advocating the AI safety uh, with respect to driving. They, they uh, sort of uh, uh, devised an experiment to see how well the Tesla the self-driving uh, is with respect to an infant uh, you know, crossing the, the crosswalk. So in, in the autonomous driving and the autonomous systems domain, we call these edge cases. So, so why is these edge cases uh, uh, so much important here? Because if we are thinking of uh, wide uh, adaptability of this technology, let's say in the next couple of years, then we, since <clears throat> uh, it affects not only those who are actually inside the car, those who are actually around uh, the roads. So that's why the edge cases are actually really important and uh, uh, something that is tied to the safety of these uh, autonomous vehicles. Um, now, uh, let me walk you through the, the modular, the self-driving system and how uh, the self-driving system actually interprets so understands uh, if they are presented with this kind of a scene. So this is a scene from a residential neighborhood. If I ask you, you know, to understand, uh, so what do you, uh, uh, how do you interpret this scene? Uh, you would definitely have a different take than uh, how the systems, uh, autonomous systems would uh, do. So. The scene understanding is broadly a process of uh, understanding or uh, comprehending or interpreting the, the content and the context of the, the visual scene. The first, uh, what it would do is uh, the perception module of the, the modular self driving system would look at uh, uh, this scene and try to understand so what type of a this, what type of a scene uh, this is. So then it would just uh, uh, classify this as a uh, residential area. So that's the uh, image classification part. Then uh, they would dig a little bit deeper into the, the scene and then try to understand what are the static parts of the, the scene. So here, the sidewalk, road, the vegetation, so through the semantic segmentation, and we are using, uh, so the current autonomous driving systems, they use state-of-the-art uh, computer vision models for this. So they would uh, run semantic segmentation on top of this image and then identify these uh, uh, static, uh, static elements. Third, uh, uh, third part is running the object uh, detection and recognition modules. So what they are trying to accomplish here is identify each and every uh, individual component. So if there is, if there's a car, if there's a ball on the road, uh, so when you piece all these, all these three steps together, what we know about this scene is uh, we, this is a scene from a residential neighborhood with uh, several static and dynamic elements. Uh, so this is what a computer vision-based uh, perception uh, does. Before it uh, you know, passes this information through, through the, the planning uh, and the execution of the modules. So <clears throat> now the question that comes to mind is, uh, so is our understanding of this scene is complete? Now that we have run the the computer vision, different modules within the computer vision based perception, is, is this complete? So, but if I ask you, you might uh, say that, okay, since there's a bowl on the road, there's a residential neighborhood, there might be a possibility of seeing a child, right? So we can do that because we have a, an innate understanding of the, the environment. So if we see a bowl on the road, we know uh, children live in residential areas, so they might just jump, uh, you know, out of the house and then uh, run through the run to get the, the boat. So uh, with that motivation, uh, the my dissertation, uh, what we are trying to accomplish is uh, transform this the vision based uh, uh, scene understanding to more of a knowledge based scene understanding. So where we couple the 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 best that computer vision based perception can uh, offer uh, with respect to perception with the background knowledge, the neurosymbolic AI. I'll explain this uh, later. So uh, we are better equipped to handle the edge cases that I mentioned uh, that I started with. Uh, we are 
So in my dissertation, particularly, we uh, looked at three types of contributions. Uh, the representation. So how do we, uh, what is the best approach to represent the driving scenes? And uh, one particular uh, instance of a uh, inference, and then uh, an innovative way of uh, labeling uh, unobserved uh, entities. Uh, I mean, if you're interested, you can just uh, reach out to me uh, and also look at uh, the uh, the published material and the tutorials that we have given uh, on this topic. Um, so uh, today's agenda, I'll be first uh, walking you through the, the representation of the scene, then uh, the inference labeling followed by uh, what type of other application areas and problems that we can apply this technology to. Okay. Okay, when it comes to representation, the research question that we have is, uh, what is the best approach uh, or better approach to represent scenes in the autonomous systems? So a uh, little bit of background. When I say a scene, a scene can be either a, a low level 2D or a 3D image. So it can be a video, it can be a uh, you know, stream of scale images, uh, or it can be a, a LIDAR image that contains uh, depth information. Uh, then uh, if you use computer vision, then of course you will have to do uh, you know, semantic segmentation, object detection, recognition, and all those things. Uh, then there, there are some uh, work, uh, works that are actually looking at uh, you know, representing the local context of a scene in something called uh, uh, scene graphs. So what a scene graph captures is the semantic, local semantic context of a scene. For, for example, if, if we have this image, uh, you have three lanes and three cars in the three different lanes. So uh, how do you represent that the car one is uh, actually on the right side of car zero and uh, the car one is actually a uh, little bit uh, far from the car zero. So, so what we can visually observe and semantically represent, so we can actually uh, represent them in a, a scene graph. Um, then there are uh, some other types of work, uh, work that look at uh, uh, representing a singular uh, dimension. Uh, one example is the spatial uh, information. So what I mean by the spatial information here is, uh, so how do we represent, let's say the autonomous car with respect to uh, other objects that are present in the scene? So uh, whether it is in, you know, uh, in, the, in the proximity. So the proximity information with respect to other uh, the objects. So the spatial graphs look at this uh, the singular dimension. Now, when looking at these three types, from low-level row scene data to the scene graphs and the uh, spatial graphs, uh, what we thought was so: what is the better representation that we can come up with to represent uh, these things? So uh, it should. So we we came up with a sort of a checklist. First thing is since the data that we come across in the autonomous driving is inherently a uh, multimodal and heterogeneous. So this uh, ideal representation should be able to represent this heterogeneous data. Then, uh, so it should be able to also represent the local context as well as the global context. I'll explain what I mean by the global context here. So the global context is uh, anything beyond that you can actually visually see. So for example, uh, the fact that uh, ball is a, a toy that children play with. And uh, children uh, live in residential neighborhoods. So those kind of contexts that you cannot visually confirm, but it is, it is we as humans know. So th that those are called like global uh, context. Then uh, we should be able to represent more than one uh, scene dimension. For example, uh, when I mentioned the spatial graphs, it only represented the, the, the special in spatial information. But let's say we want to represent the time or the temporal information. So this representation should allow us to do uh, both. <laughs> then uh, uh, finally, since uh, the computer vision is predominantly used in, uh, you know, across the board of these autonomous driving systems. So we should be able to easily integrate uh, this, uh, this representation with the existing uh, algorithms. So uh, fortunately, uh, a better representation is available that uh, that we can actually tick all these uh, requirements off. It's a, it's called a knowledge graph. So if you are someone who is not familiar with the knowledge graph, uh, so knowledge graph is a representation. Uh, it's a semantic representation of the, the data. 
uh, so it allows you to represent the uh, context of a particular domain in an ontology, something called an ontology, then uh, while also keeping the, the actual data instances uh, inst instantiated as a knowledge graph. So you would have the metadata, the data, uh, their semantic uh, relations, everything captured in a, a giant uh, a graph. And uh, fortunately, the knowledge graphs, it also has an added advantage. It adheres to uh, the FAIR principles. That means the findability, accessibility, interoperability, and the, the reusability. So we picked the uh, uh, knowledge graph as the, the better representation here. Then uh, uh, when, when looking at the automotive data, so we have two types of scenes. So we have uh, something called a sequence scene, which is basically a video. Like if you take a video of uh, 10, 20 seconds, and uh, then all the metadata that comes with that uh, video is uh, represented as a sequence scene or a, a scene. Then uh, if you have a predefined uh, sampling rate, you would sample that video so you have set up uh, a stream of uh, sub scenes or frame scenes. So then uh, the metadata relevant to this frame scene is actually different from the uh, from those of uh, uh, sequence scenes. So so we should be able to uh, represent these both both of these types in the the new representation. Um, so we started with the goal that building uh, building a, a unified knowledge representation. So we looked at uh, uh, multiple uh, uh, openly available autonomous driving data sets. Uh, actually, we looked at uh, four different autonomous driving data sets. And then uh, with the help of domain experts, so we, uh, we sat down and uh, just uh, gathered uh, the information about, so what are the important aspects of a, a C that we should represent in, a, in an ontology? So uh, this is a phase called the ontological commitment, where a group of experts uh, decide on okay, uh, this is how you should, uh, this is what you should include into into in the, the ontology, and this is how they should be connected. So after uh, having this driving since ontology developed, then uh, since the knowledge graphs, as I said, adheres to fair principles, it allows us to now easily integrate external knowledge. So it can be, you know, geospatial, common sense, uh, cyber, uh, uh, social data. So the goal here uh, was to build a, a unified uh, graphical representation, a semantic representation that allows us to represent both data, metadata, uh, and external knowledge in, in the same place. Um, so, as I said, the ontology, uh, what we did was we looked at multiple knowledge graphs, uh, so multiple uh, data sets, and then we gathered all the all different types of uh, uh, labels that they have given. So then we had to do something called a normalization. So let's say um, a pedestrian in one data set uh, would be labeled as something else in a different data set. So we'll have to do sort of a normalization to uh, unify uh, both. So uh, then we'll have to introduce the semantic relations. You know, uh, a pedestrian uh, is of type uh, person, a child is of type uh, person. Uh, this kind of uh, relations will have to be introduced here. Uh, then when it comes to actually representing the, the automotive data, uh, it is something called uh, instantiation. So what we do is we look at each, uh, each and every scene then, uh, so the computer vision models actually gave, uh, I mean, they draw bounding boxes and they label uh, what, are the, what are these bounding boxes, right? So what we get those information and we actually represent them, uh, uh, something, see, represent them here, uh, for example, you can represent that there's a, a pedestrian instance here and there's a parked car instance. So we can also now get uh, access to the, the metadata, we can represent this, for example, what is the time that we have recorded this scene? And uh, from where did we capture this scene? That's the location information. Um, so after doing this process uh, for uh, like many, all the scenes available in the data sets, uh, so these are actually two example knowledge graphs that we have developed. Uh, uh, 
Uh, for example, the Panda set KG contains about uh, 3 million uh, triples, and uh, it has uh, about uh, 53,000 uh, entities. Uh, you can see the, the entity frequency here. I mean, as expected, uh, they uh, follow a long tail uh, distribution because you would not see, uh, let's say, ambulances and wheelchairs as often as you would see a car or a pedestrian. Okay, uh, then uh, we looked at uh, in enriching this knowledge graph with two types of uh, external knowledge. Uh, first one is the, the geospatial knowledge. So what we did was, uh, uh, so some of the da some data sets they only contain the uh, they only contain the uh, latitude and the longitude of the of the sea. So that numeric representation of latitude and longitude doesn't uh, carry any semantic meaning, right? So what we did was we uh, used something called open street maps that could decode the the latitude longitude information into uh, something more meaningful. For example, we can enrich that uh, okay in this particular location point uh, uh, there's a uh, uh, you know parking lane there's a hospital. So all these um, additional information location information are actually now uh, integrated into the knowledge graph that we have built. Uh, in the second case, uh, we looked at uh, a rich uh, common sense repository called the common sense knowledge graph, uh, and we added uh, some common sense relations uh, to the, the graph as well. For example, you know, a bus is more efficient than a car, uh, a pedicab is sexually related to a bicycle. So uh, then this, this, this representation would, uh, would be, is now more, more enriched with uh, like you know everyday common sense uh, uh, knowledge okay so in this part we looked at uh, so we made the case that uh, knowledge graphs are a better representation uh, or better alternative to represent the uh, the scenes and we constructed this uh, the data set agnostic uh, the driving scenes ontology so to structure the concepts and the relations and uh, I showed the construction of two large uh, knowledge graphs uh, to represent these real driving scenes. And uh, we also uh, we also demonstrated that how we can enrich these knowledge graphs with uh, external uh, information. Okay. In the, the next part, uh, I'll walk you through a particular case of an inference that we uh, actually looked at. Um, so here the, the research question is, uh, now that we have a knowledge graph, right? Uh, uh, we started with, uh, uh, ma with making a case that a knowledge graph are a better representation. So how can we use this, the knowledge graph that we built uh, to do advanced inferencing? Um, so knowledge-based entity prediction is a, is a problem that we, uh, we uh, introduced. So it's the task of uh, predicting the inclusion of uh, potentially uh, potentially missing entities or potential entities. As given that the current and the background knowledge is represented as a, a knowledge graph. So I'm taking the same example I showed you earlier. So if we have a if you are given a scene uh, with the ball on the road, then uh, can we leverage the semantic information or semantic representation that we have in the graph? to infer there's a possibility of uh, seeing a child. Um, so we hypothesize that uh, the use of knowledge graph provides an expressive or a holistic representation of the scene knowledge. And uh, we can uh, leverage uh, neurosymbolic AI or the knowledge infused learning uh, for the, for the uh, task of knowledge completion. Um, when we think of uh, methods that we can use to uh, solve this problem, there are uh, multiple ways that we can uh, solve this. So one uh, particular example is uh, something called link prediction, which I'll uh, explain later. Uh, for the time being, let me first, uh, let me uh, focus on the link prediction, uh, while you can also have, you know, association, association rule mining or collective classification to solve the, the same problem. Um, so <clears throat> when I say that we, we can build a knowledge graph to a particular domain, right. Uh, to represent the data and the metadata, we also, uh, we also have this assumption that 
the knowledge that we have in the graph is inherently incomplete. So what I, what I mean by that is, so it is not practical to, let's say, capture everything that we know of a domain and build a one giant knowledge graph uh, and be done with it, right? So because the knowledge can, uh, can change over time. So we can uh, add or delete uh, uh, stuff uh, when we you know, use it. So the link prediction is a task that is uh, focused on completing the knowledge graph, completing the, the graph with new knowledge that is inferred through the, the inherent connections. So what would happen is so you start with the graph and you consider everything that is present in the graph as positives. Then you generate uh, uh, obvious negatives by corrupting the, the triples. And then uh, you train a, a machine learning model that would that would uh, that would actually motivate the model to do uh, these correct predictions and demotivate the model to do the, the negative uh, connection negative uh, uh, connections. So after we run this uh, model uh, for several you know uh, through several uh, triples, we learn an embedding space that is aware of uh, the semantic uh, information. Um, there are different types of, uh, you know, uh, algorithms. So there are, you know, the matrix factorization based algorithms, the geometric uh, uh, class, and the deep learning based uh, algorithms for this uh, link prediction. So what we did was uh, we came up with a, a simple, uh, simple algorithm that uh, for a given for a given scene, we assume the current observations are incomplete, and we try to uh, infer, so what are the most plausible uh, new entities that are actually not observed in the current scene? So, so uh, to, to devise an experiment, what we do is we first mask, uh, let's say, the E2 and E5, and then train the model, and see during the test time whether we can uh, infer uh, the E2 and E5. So this is basically a supervised learning, supervised learning uh, method. Um, based on the results that we have, uh, we were able to uh, predict uh, the inclusion of a potential entity with uh, 0.87 uh, uh, precision and uh, accuracy of 0.88, sorry, 88% accuracy. Um, then the key takeaways here, uh, so this is a, a novel uh, problem formulation, uh, knowledge-based uh, entity prediction that leverages the relational knowledge in the scene uh, knowledge graph to predict uh, unobserved entities. And uh, we showed through the experimentation that uh, this way of predicting can achieve a peak performance of 88% uh, uh, accuracy. Um, then we applied this actually to two different data sets. So one, one data set, uh, which is called Pandaset. So it contains scenes only uh, uh, from San Francisco area. But the data set that is called a new scenes, it contains scenes from uh, two continents, uh, Boston, USA, and uh, Singapore. So you have you know left-hand driving versus right-hand right driving there, and the driving, uh, driving situations are actually inherently different uh, in uh, both the cases. So we were trying to see if we are proposing this as a generic, uh, you know, generic algorithm, how would this uh, perform in these kind of uh, extreme situations? Uh, okay. Then, uh, I mean, so far, do you have any, any questions? Okay. So, uh... For training the embedding model, mm -hmm. uh, like you said, the child is additional context that is sort of difficult for uh, AI systems to understand. Right. And uh, now you will have to tell it that this is a potential ground truth. Right. 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 So, right. how does that ground truth uh, come? Where does it come from? That comes from the ontology. The ontology? Yes. So, I'm assuming what you mean by this is if you run a reasoner, it right. would say that the yes. child should be there. Yes, yes. Okay, and that is treated as yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Because otherwise there's no way for us to feed that information as you said. Uh, right. So that's one of the difficulties we had because uh, in, 
I mean, there's no way that we can actually come up with all the correct uh, ground truths uh, um, that, are, can, that can be applied to autonomous driving, right? Yes. So with respect to what we have in the data sets, what we do is we do sort of a uh, sort of an inference. So we uh, we have the ontology to represent the high level concepts and the, the relations, mm -hmm. and we try to infer based on the data what are the additional uh, ground truths. So we treat them as like you know gold. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Um, any other questions? Yeah. Is there any like state of the art that you're comparing this to, or so this task? Yes. No. So this is a new task. So we 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 formalize this as a, a knowledge completion task. Uh, when we started, there were no uh, knowledge graphs autonomous driving. So we had to. That's why we had to build one ourselves. Uh, so we had to build the ontology. We have to build the the knowledge graph. Everything from scratch. Yeah. When we started, we didn't have any any anything. Question is whether uh, in the use of the unit of software, yeah. so, uh, the many autonomous driving units software, all the vendors have something. Uh, so now it's nothing that does this particular project. Is this developing uh, necessary or important uh, for development like, uh, like the autonomous driving? So on a related note, uh, uh, yesterday. So the day before, I found out that uh, uh, we had a recent citation. A Chinese uh, autonomous self-driving company. Uh, so all the authors are from that company. They actually used the knowledge graph that we have built uh, and the ontology uh, to do a similar kind of a stuff. So they acknowledge the, the knowledge graph and the, the, the task that we have, that I presented to you. Because uh, they they had is it a paper, or archive? paper, archive. It is under review uh, for... CVPR, I guess. Uh, okay. The third, third, uh, the subtopic uh, of my talk is uh, uh, labeling. Uh, so here, <clears throat> uh, I I already uh, I all I first uh, made the case that we have an ample data in this domain because uh, in autonomous driving, since uh, there are a lot of AI. Uh, capabilities can be assessed through the autonomous driving. So now all the companies, all the big players in autonomous driving, they have spent a uh, million software driving hours collecting this data and releasing uh, to the public. So we can actually you know, make use of them, come up with new problems, uh, play with. So, but it is always the case that this labeling that they have done uh, with, uh, you know, they're doing it in a semi-automatic way they are using state-of-the-art uh, computation algorithms and also humans to verify this labeling is inherently incomplete. So uh, in this particular task, uh, what, what we were looking at was, so how to augment the existing data sets with uh, labels for unobserved entities. So let's say if uh, someone is actually developing a new algorithm for uh, object detection, and they are also looking at, let's say, occlusion scenarios where uh, you cannot see visually see a particular object, and then still want to use uh, uh, object detection. Then this would become a data source for them to, uh, you know, play with the, or you know, run the experiments with. Um, so then, since I started uh, with saying that there can be unobserved entities, so let us look at uh, uh, why would we have unobserved entities in this kind of a, you know, uh, mission critical domain? So for example, the first one is an occlusion. So you can see this, uh, there's a pedestrian here that is occluded by the, the blue car. So if you have a camera placed, uh, uh, let's say uh, at the front of a car, then that car, so the, the field of view is actually now occluded with that uh, blue car. So you would not see the visual, any visual cue. Uh, to represent uh, the person. Then, uh, of course, uh, let's say if you have uh, vision-only uh, autonomous driving like in Tesla, so you would not have any other sensors. You will have to just rely on the uh, computer vision. So, but if you have degrading weather and even to an acre dice, you cannot actually see what is in front. So how would we expect a camera to, uh, uh, you know, identify or capture what is in the scene. So uh, this could also lead to having some objects go unobserved. 
then uh, there can also be uh, sensor failures. Uh, so let's say if a critical sensor fails uh, right in the middle of a drive, then how would we uh, assume that the uh, perception is complete? So we cannot. <clears throat> then there can be, since we are using uh, you know, machine learning or the AI algorithms, there can be also model errors that leads to, uh, let's say, misclassification. So rather than just uh, you know annotating uh, the child as an adult, uh, so sort of these sort of like misclassification errors. Uh, then we also have the uh, the limitations, hardware limitations. For example, let's say uh, one company might use a field of a camera that has a wide a field of view, uh, whereas another company could use a, a narrow a field of view camera. Uh, and finally, since uh, we are dealing with driving here, uh, even as humans, we encounter novel scenarios. So that cannot be that that we cannot fully you know anticipate. So so it is inherently a possible that we would have novel scenarios that we have never thought of. So we, we have to creatively assess uh, the risk and you know drive accordingly. So due to these kind of uh, uh, issues. Uh, we would have unobserved entities, uh, even though we use uh, a combination of uh, human annotators and the state of the art. Excuse me. Was there a question uh, from those who are joining online? Okay. Uh, in fact, we found out uh, in one of the data sets that we looked at, uh, there are 12.49% 12, 12 incomplete seats, meaning uh, so there are information about unobserved entities in 12.49% uh, of seats. So the research question was, uh, <clears throat> how can we augment this existing data set with labels uh, for these unobserved entities? Um, so when, we, when I say the label augmentation, you might also think of a data augmentation. Uh, so data augmentation is something like, uh, let's say uh, you have one example of a, a butterfly, then uh, since there's a huge, let's say, uh, label uh, imbalance, so you want to create more synthetic examples. So you would create some properties, you would go, you would transform this image with, uh, you know, using different techniques. So you would expand the data set with now uh, six uh, cases of butterflies. So this is not what I mean by label augmentation. So we are actually not trying to improve the size of the data set, rather uh, the labels per se. That's what uh, our uh, target here. Um, <clears throat> then uh, uh, to, to develop a technique uh, that can, that we can actually uh, write as a, you know, sort of a, uh, deterministic rule. So we looked at how um, uh, how the object permanence is, uh, is appearing in, in, in the uh, psychology and the, the, the semantic domain. So you obviously uh, might have come across this thing uh, called, uh, uh, you know, pick up. So if you, we as humans gain this ability, I think around the two years of our, uh, you know, age. So if you ask, a, if you give show a, a ball to a, a you know toddler, and then hide that ball with let's say with the, the cardboard, and then you would ask whether there's a ball. So this is they would gain this ability around two years of age, saying that okay, yes, even though I do not visually see the the ball, there is actually a ball. That's called uh, object permanence. Uh, so this is this has been well studied uh, in uh, you know development psychology. And it has also been adapted uh, to using uh, basic uh, representations, semantic representations. There's something called a basic formal ontology that uh, represents the, the basic uh, functions of a you know, uh, scene or environment. So <clears throat> uh, basic formal ontology represents these, uh, uh, these uh, scenarios as continuance. So, by taking the motivations from these uh, both uh, cases, uh, what we thought was, so let's say that we have a, uh, a pedestrian occluded by a, a car, even though we cannot visually see the, the pedestrian at that point or the human at that point. So when, when the time is T plus one, 
the person appears, right? So what that means is, even though at the same T, you cannot see that pedestrian should have actually been labeled. Because uh, if that information was available to the, uh, the, the model, then it would have taken actions to, okay, let's see, I should have to be more cautious than you know, speeding up here. So uh, then what we did was we uh, devised a simple uh, deterministic algorithm that uh, uh, infers objects and uh, objects, sorry, entities that are actually not present in the current scene, but are present in the, the neighboring scenes. For example, uh, in the same, if I'm taking the same case here, so if uh, scene T is not uh, just annotated with the parked car, uh, we would now include a new annotation called, uh, you know, a pedestrian uh, to the scene T. <clears throat> so uh, we still use the, the knowledge graph that we build because uh, it allows us to uh, walk through the scenes, uh, uh, you know, more intuitively, and uh, we we run this algorithm uh, for uh, all the scenes, and that's when we found out that actually we can improve twelve percent, twelve point five percent of the scenes with additional annotations. Um, so you can see here, uh, this is an actual example from uh, one of the datasets. So here uh, you can see the original annotation given was a car, but uh, when you look at the you when you analyze the neighboring context, uh, we can see that person who's in the car comes out of the car with the with an object in hand. So those two annotations come like let's say five five ten uh, scenes uh, uh, ahead or before. So now that we know that information, we actually enrich the scene with these two additional. Uh, labels. <clears throat> okay. Now we looked at uh, we we investigated this problem of uh, you know observed entity labeling, uh, unobserved entity labeling, which is uh, caused by several perception failures. And uh, I walked you through uh, the the algorithm that we come up with called uh, context based uh, uh, labeling of unobserved entity or clue. Uh, which is based on this Piaget's theory of uh, object permanence. And uh, uh, we also uh, develop an interactive uh, Python interface. So let's say if you are developing a new uh, data set, so you, let's say if you are a company who, you know, collects the data, uh, you know, use computer vision and then use humans to validate label and still wants to improve them with uh, this uh, permanence information, you can actually uh, use this package to, uh, do this enrichment. <clears throat> okay. Um, now that we looked at three uh, three different areas, uh, representation, inference, and labeling, uh, I thought we can also, uh, I thought of also sharing some applications beyond autonomous driving that we can apply this uh, technology. So we so far we have been looking at the driving sense, right? Um, another similar uh, domain that we can observe uh, the entities and events is uh, manufacturing. Uh, you know, similar to uh, driving scenes, we would have different objects. Then there are different uh, uh, events that is happening in a manufacturing world. But uh, one key difference is the, in the driving, it is not a, a closed space. So you can just you can't just have a bird's eye view camera and capture everything that is around you. So it's called like open uh, world problem, but in the manufacturing, it's closed world. So you know what is actually in the, the, the manufacturing cell because you can actually capture everything uh, around you. So, but since there are you know a lot of similarities, uh, we actually thought of uh, applying the, 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 the technical uh, contributions of this uh, the work towards the manufacturing domain. Um, so, <clears throat> In the manufacturing scene understanding, what we looked at was, so if we have a manufacturing cell that contains the physical sensors, uh, you know, computer, so uh, cameras, uh, different types of sensors, uh, then we can also use the, uh, the knowledge graphs, uh, the representation learning, and the, uh, the entity prediction to improve the, uh, the manufacturing scenes. So, 
we are proposing here to view the manufacturing, so let's say videos and sensor data coming from the manufacturing domain as manufacturing seeds. So we are we want to leverage the, the multimodal data along with the relevant background knowledge. So we then we can improve the understanding of the manufacturing context here. Uh, one particular uh, example we looked at was the, the rare event uh, detection and prediction. So uh, we have a collaboration with uh, uh, the McNair team uh, in the manufacturing. So they uh, they have a the cell that that manufactures uh, that assembles uh, rockets. So you would have uh, a tray uh, that is you know three D printed uh, components of the robot. Sorry, a, a rocket. Then they have a uh, sort of a end-to-end uh, -end pipeline that you know one robot just picks up uh, the pieces, then another robot would just take over these pieces and then assemble the parts. Uh, and finally, when you have the uh, everything you know smoothly done, you would get a complete rocket built. So, but in this case, uh, let's say uh, there's a misalignment of the input tray. Uh, then the one robot which is programmed to just pick up uh, a particular component from the right uh, place would just miss that. So that would just uh, trigger a you know, cascading effect. So all the other reports, because uh, they are actually dependent on the correct behavior of the first robot, right? So we, uh, in collaboration with the McNair team, we generated the data set uh, that contains these type of errors. So these are actually called a rare events uh, in manufacturing, because if you think of a manufacturing cell, right? So we can't afford to just shut down uh, an entire manufacturing uh, pipeline because of a failure. So these things are, you know, thought through. So people have done, you know, implemented a lot of guardrails not to have this kind of events happening. But still, even in a man, in a more mature manufacturing settings, setting, this type of events occur. They do occur. So unfortunately, we have to shut down. Uh, the manufacturing cells and it would cause you know millions of damage so uh, what we did here was uh, we gathered the manufacturing data from the the cell and then we uh, we are trying to see whether we can devise a technique that could analyze the the behavior uh, of the uh, uh, robots through the sensor data along with the semantic information that we can capture. So for example, uh, we can, uh, so let's say with respect to a particular robot, right? So it comes with the operational guideline. So this robot, let's say arm works uh, from uh, 30 degrees uh, Fahrenheit to uh, 100 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. So if that particular part is actually recording an 105, we know that this is, that is an anomaly because uh, that information is actually now, we, we were given that information from the manufacturers. So our objective was to gather this type of information uh, uh, that you know uh, those experienced individuals uh, would know and represent them in a, a similar way as a, as a graph and leverage those knowledge towards uh, capturing or predicting uh, the rare events. Um, if you are interested in this topic, uh, this is a, a review, a comprehensive review uh, that we have, uh, you know, that is still uh, under review, but we made them uh, available in the archive. Uh, we look at uh, about, I think, 70, uh, 73 data sets uh, in, the, uh, in, in different domains. So we looked at manufacturing, uh, then economics, uh, uh, geospatial domain, so we are trying to see what are the uh, you know state of the art techniques that are being used to handle rare events, what type of data and what type of modalities that of data that we have, uh, and try to see <clears throat> what are the best ways to uh, predict those things and forecast. Uh, so basically, detection and forecasting both. Um, with that. Uh, yeah, I conclude uh, yeah, this part of the talk. I mean, if you have any questions, just uh, yeah, just feel free to ask. Question? Okay. 
you know if there's any application for nursing law AI and like natural language processing? Of know? course, of course. I mean, there are several projects in our lab. Uh, actually, Kaushik here, he works uh, in you know neurosymbolic AI applied to natural language uh, uh, domain. So we have particularly mental health related projects. And we have uh, one project that is looking at the analogy. So in the, you know, natural language, the analogy is one of the, uh, the tougher the task and the natural language understanding uh, where, you know, when you increase the length of the, uh, let's say, uh, context from just one word, like, you know, king versus queen, or man versus woman to, let's say, one passage describing uh, a particular uh, process. And let's say uh, photoelectric uh, to something else. So we have we are using you know we are using different types of neurosymbolic solutions to address uh, uh, problems within the natural language, uh, and with 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 several uh, applications domains in mind. So Kaushik, for example, is working on the mental health related projects. Yeah. Applications include natural language processing, understanding and generation. It includes uh, smart manufacturing. It includes very good. It includes nutrition. Um, it includes uh, cyber security, fake news detection. Uh, uh, so I really raised the uh, hallucination. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, really very interesting example. There was a post that showed uh, Magic Johnson, uh, and the description said Magic Johnson, you know, uh, was giving blood or you know, uh, donating blood. Now, um, the genetic AI technique, uh, which is dependent on data, cannot understand, cannot identify this as fake news. But if you have knowledge that many, many choices is HIV positive, and HIV positive people cannot do the blood, now you have reason to suspect that this is fake news. But without this knowledge, you can't do that. Yeah. So, this is a very clear and intuitive example. Uh, I think, for example, for cybersecurity or fake news, but in Many all these cases you see that um, purely data driven approach uh, that is used by all the AI is not adequate, but you uh, need to apply additional knowledge, have additional knowledge to make uh, to solve the problem. And the knowledge can be broad variety, it can be lexical knowledge, linguistic knowledge, common sense knowledge, broad based world knowledge like Wikipedia, and domain specific knowledge like UMLS or. You know, medical, you know, vocabulary or other things like that, or any other domain, for example. So, all humans, um, when they understand uh, language, they apply all of them. So, today, if I talk about cyber security, that is a domain, but you all know how to parse, you all know the linguistic things and you know, words that are and the same meaning, you all know common sense things, you all have some core knowledge, say, strange and belongs to this college of. You know, uh, is is So all that is necessary to truly understand the language. And uh, so language processing can be done extremely well using genetic technology. Example of language processing is the uh, language translation. The language understanding on which the say a, a, an application resides, like initial making a decision based on what is said. It has to tie to appropriate medical concepts before you can make decisions. And for that understanding, knowledge becomes critical. Okay, anything else? Yeah? So I have a question for you all. Is there anybody in terms of the you think of increasing AI sensors? AI sensors? Yeah, like how do you think about AI sensors? Of course. So uh, <clears throat> there's a, uh, a dedicated uh, group of researchers who are actually looking at the, the cyber uh, cyber security. And let's say, for example, uh, I can give an example about uh, uh, one project that they look at uh, in the uh, vehicle, vehicle uh, sensors. So what they were looking at was, let's say that you have a car, that all the new cars come uh, equipped with a lot of sensors, right? So they were trying to see uh, whether they can do a malicious attack uh, on the, the sensor data. So this, if the, let's say if the car is actually connected to internet, so they have you know uh, 
in vehicle, uh, let's say Wi-Fi, uh, in vehicle uh, cellular communication. They were trying to actually alter the the feeds uh, of cameras, and then see whether they can it can trigger uh, some uh, uh, unexpected behavior. So they were trying to now uh, implement techniques uh, or guardrails to prevent this kind of a malicious attack happening. Yeah, of course, it's a possibility, and there are there are people working on it here. Yeah. <clears throat> If you are interested, just uh, search Edge AI. Uh, in Edge AI, people actually you know talk about uh, you know what type of algorithms that you can in use. What, AI. yeah, Edge, yeah, Edge, 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 Edge. E D G E, Edge oh. AI. Oh, Edge, Edge. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to um, get uh, a very interesting talk uh, schedule. Uh, I'll know soon whether I can do it. But, uh, and here, uh, uh, this will be somebody um, who got PhD some years ago, uh, but he has been kind of a serial entrepreneur. And right now, he has a fantastic, um, uh, uh, very exciting uh, generative AI company uh, with application and agriculture. So we'll see whether we can uh, get him. And, uh, uh, so we'll try to mix, you know, Research centric and you know, core learning centric thing with sort of applied and you know, people who are in the field and and you know, what how they see the new topics. All right, so don't forget Thanks, to send your video on the back here.